Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Senate Education, Tuesday, June 2nd, uh, continuing remote hearings. And today we're going to be doing a mix of things, looking at a couple of different bills. But before we do that, um, as everybody knows, we had some news out of um, out of the Burlington Colchester area, disturbing news for those of us following child care and especially for me, um, the, the child care at UVM where my kid went um, and where I participated in a, I think, 50th anniversary um, ceremony for them announced that they are ending operations, as did the child care center at St. Mike's. So it touched off um, some concern in the Senate in general, and I wanted to, as quickly as we could, try to um, connect with CDD about um, their thinking on child care stabilization as we um, reopen child care centers. I've asked the people who run the UVM Center to testify. They couldn't make it today, but hopefully Thursday we'll hear from them. But I, I thought if I could uh, start with um, Deputy Commissioner Berbeco and I know this is not news to you, nor is the fact that most um, child cares are on a knife's edge economically anyway. But I'm just wondering if you can um, run down for us your um, view of the state's ongoing support uh, as we reopen the child care centers. Things like, um, is there a plan to continue stabilization even though centers are nominally open, but open at less than full capacity, that sort of thing. And then we can, we can chime in with other questions and avenues of examination as we go. So welcome and, and feel free to start anywhere you like, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, and good afternoon, Senators, good afternoon, Committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Stephen Berbeco, Deputy Commissioner for the Child Development Division. I'm here today together with CDD's Director of Policy, Melissa Regal-Garrett, and uh, we are here to give an update on a reopening of childcare after uh, this uh, two, two and a half month closure period. Um, on a high level, uh, I'll be talking about uh, finances, uh, capacity, um, health and safety, uh, supplies, and uh, data. Uh, and this aligns with the uh, memo that we provided to the committee. Um, first on the uh, topic of finances, uh, the state has uh, concluded uh, two programs that ran during the closure period, a stabilization program for programs that were closed and an incentive program uh, for programs that were open and serving the children of essential persons. Uh, these programs sunset on May 31st, uh, and we have a, a firm deadline for submitting invoices to make sure that we can provide payment uh, to all of the child care providers before the end of the fiscal year. Um, in addition, the Department for Children and Families is administering a restart stipend program uh, where uh, child care programs and summer day camps uh, were able to put in a very simple application uh, and receive a cash payment uh, from the Department for Children and Families uh, to help them with some of the costs associated with um, continuing operations and uh, reopening uh, costs associated with uh, purchasing supplies, uh, perhaps hiring new staff members, um, and frankly giving them a, a leg up going into the summer. Uh, that program is a $6 million program. Uh, and I understand from our colleagues in DCF uh, that they expect uh, most of the payments to go out uh, this week and next. Uh, so a very short turnaround uh, to put, hands, put money in the hands of providers and summer day camp uh, uh, directors at a time when they need it. Could uh, I just well. uh, ask a clarifying question there? I think that's great. Um, and obviously you worked very quickly to get money in people's hands. Is it a one-time payment? And what are, the, what are the limits for how, how high it might be? 
Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. It, it is a one-time payment, uh, timed to the beginning of the summer uh, to help programs open uh, during the summer. Um, and the awards are uh, computed or calculated uh, depending on the number of slots that a program has and the number of days that the program will be open. Uh, so a program with a small number of slots and a small number of days will get less money than a program open for the entire summer uh, with a large number of slots for children. Uh, there are some typical numbers uh, that we have heard uh, from our colleagues in DCF. Um, and Melissa, please correct me if I get these incorrect. Uh, I believe that a family-based, uh, sorry, a home-based uh, childcare provider uh, could expect uh, typically uh, $3,800 um, and a childcare center with uh, 70 or 75 children um, would receive, I don't have my fingers on those numbers. Um, I'd be happy to provide an update to the committee. Oh, uh, Melissa, uh, would you mind providing some detail here? Uh, I am opening the document as we speak, so I hope to be able to provide an update in about two minutes. Thank you. Um, while Melissa is doing that, I want to add that uh, some of the uh, larger programs received a stipend payment of uh, over $100,000, uh, which is a great way to support them uh, as they go into the summer months. And um, well, can I just ask what the definition of summer yeah. is? So it starts June 1st and goes to when? Uh, th these are programs that have committed to be open uh, by July 6th. And then do they have to be open like through September or something or what? Or is there uh, an end date? Well, um, uh, typically these programs run through the end of August. Uh, and the longer a program is open, uh, the larger the stipend amount. Um, Melissa, do you have that information? I do, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what we know is that um, a registered home who will be open all summer with 10 kids uh, would receive approximately $3,800. Um, and then a larger center open all summer with 75 slots, for example, um, would receive $28,500. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and DCF has uh, timed the, the payments so that the payments to go out first were to programs that are already open on June 1st. Uh, and the last payments to go out uh, will be to providers who are open closer to July 6th. Although with payments going out this week and next, I anticipate that money will be in the hands of the providers um, by the end of next week. Mm -hmm. uh, Another uh, update that we have on uh, the topic of finances is uh, our CCFAP program, uh, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, um, has uh, changed back from uh, enrollment basis to attendance basis uh, now in the month of June. Uh, and this puts uh, the uh, control of uh, and, and decision making of uh, child care subsidy uh, back in the hands of families. Um, at the same time, uh, we have extended the so-called U code uh, for families to use during the month of June uh, for cases where families, uh, for whatever reason, uh, feel that it's not the right time to send their child back to child care, but they would like to keep their slot with a child care provider. They can work with their eligibility specialist uh, to use the uh, U code um, to provide payment to the child care provider during the month of June and keep that slot. Mm -hmm. um, on uh, capacity, I want to uh, uh, remind the committee that, uh, as you well know, uh, Vermont has had a capacity uh, challenge with respect to child care going back certainly before the time of this closure. Uh, and the latest data that I saw was uh, pre-closure. There were approximately 9,000 fewer slots statewide uh, than the demand uh, would have otherwise uh, needed. Um, and certainly during closure, uh, we have worked very hard within CDD uh, to uh, make sure that families uh, who are families of essential persons uh, have the, had access to the childcare that they needed uh, when they needed it. 
uh, in a way that was uh, accessible to them. Uh, now that we're coming out of the closure period, uh, that uh, effort certainly has not uh, ended. Uh, we have a statewide network of child care referral specialists who are available uh, to families to help them with uh, referrals to open and available child care programs throughout the state. Uh, their information is updated um, pretty much daily uh, in cooperation with our licensing staff uh, to make sure that they have the most recent information about what's available where. As well, our licensing staff and our child care business technicians uh, work together with child care providers who are looking to uh, expand their uh, number of uh, slots that are available. Uh, so in some cases, there's a child care provider who may look at their current location and want to uh, find a, a different location. Uh, and we have a variance process uh, for that. Uh, it's, it's already set within regulation. Um, and we expedite uh, those requests to make sure that child care providers have a location that works for them and for their families uh, as quickly as possible in a way that is uh, safe and appropriate for our children. Uh, and uh, moving on to uh, health guidance and supplies, uh, our colleagues at the uh, Vermont Department of Health have been doing an extraordinary job, I feel, uh, in uh, holding webinars uh, with a variety of interest groups, uh, including childcare providers, of course, and also uh, parents and families, um, to uh, update them on recent changes to health guidance. Um, they also staff a, a call-in number uh, with public health nurses uh, so that when a child care provider or a family has a question about um, health guidance, they have someone that they can talk to one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and the information, as I understand it, uh, the information that VDH uh, gathers from those conversations goes right back into their planning uh, for updates to their guidance. Uh, and the most recent uh, guidance that has come out for June 1st, again, as I understand it, uh, was informed directly by those conversations uh, in a positive way. Um, as well, uh, we are continuing, continuing to uh, support child care providers as best we can with supplies. Uh, yesterday and today, uh, uh, CDD is working together with uh, partners, uh, state agency partners and community partners, uh, to man and distribute um, supplies to uh, child care providers uh, and children's integrated service providers uh, across the state. Uh, there were two sites that were set up yesterday uh, and there are two sites again today um, for the distribution of uh, cloth facial coverings, uh, non-contact infrared thermometers to providers who don't already have one, either because they've purchased one or they've already received one for us, uh, and uh, limited supplies of hand soap. Uh, I have to say that I went to the distribution site in Colchester uh, yesterday uh, and was excited by the turnout um, already before our start time. There was a long line. Uh, and the conversations that I had with child care providers who were waiting in line, uh, I found on the whole very encouraging. Uh, there were some providers who had already reopened uh, that day, yesterday, uh, and they were very excited uh, to tell me about that experience uh, and also to share the excitement that they felt from the families uh, that they were able to welcome back in and the children that they were able to welcome back in uh, to the programs. Um, on the topic of uh, data, uh, we are uh, making our best effort to track uh, data on a day-to-day -day basis about programs that are uh, open and reopening and closed and closed permanently. Uh, unfortunately, the data system that we currently have, uh, Bright Futures Information System, uh, has a very limited capability in this regard. And so we're able to track the number of expired licenses uh, but we're not able to track the number of programs that are currently open. Uh, we are trying to get a handle on that data uh, using um, information that is available to us. Um, and as we move forward, we're looking to refine that process to try to get uh, uh, 
data that is more stable uh, and, and helpful for us in um, our work to support uh, childcare providers uh, and families. And, uh, and with that, I uh, would welcome questions from the committee. Uh, before we do that, maybe um, Ms. Regal Garrett, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, you're still muted. No, nope. still muted. You can give us a yes or huh? no. Hey, there how we about go. that? <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, no, I um, think the deputy covered it just fine, and I'm uh, anxious to help support uh, any details in terms of your questions. Okay, great. Committee members, questions for uh, Deputy Commissioner Berbeco. I have one. Oop, go ahead, Luke. Thanks, Phil. Um, and hi, Steve and, and Melissa. It's good to see you guys again. Um, <laughs> I, um, I appreciate the update. And um, uh, a cup, one question I have is you mentioned, Steve, the 9,000 slots short before COVID. Did you mention how many you are estimating were short now, or are you still not sure because of the inadequate statewide data system? Uh, and, and thank you for that question, Senator Hardy. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have our finger on that number uh, right now. Okay. Uh, we, we do have um, a very rough uh, approximation of the number of providers that are open uh, or opening uh, mm -hmm. in the next few weeks. Uh, and we hope as we continue to uh, move forward that we'll be able to uh, determine more, more stable numbers. Okay. And I know that you fi finished the stabilization program, that that was something you were running just during the COVID crisis and now it's ended. However, it's really clear that childcare centers and home providers need ongoing stabilization payments in order to be able to continue to be open, particularly because they're opening um, at lower enrollments and therefore don't have the tuition payments. And you know, this may be just something that we as the legislature need to provide to you to be able to provide to childcare centers. Um, but have you, uh, do you have a position on uh, a longer term stabilization program, maybe one that would at least go through the end of 2020 and provide stabilization payments to these programs as they get back up on their feet? and then hopefully increasing the subsidies and other payments, the pre-K payments and things like that so that more families are supported. But I've never heard you testify that you think a stabilization program should continue in some form. So I wonder what your position is on that. Uh, thank you, Senator Hardy. Uh, as you pointed out, the stabilization program uh, was developed and established to uh, help keep uh, the child care uh, structure and infrastructure afloat during the closure period. Um, that, that was uh, the goal. And now that we're out of the closure period, as you point out, the stabilization program has ended. Uh, the administration is uh, certainly watching uh, very carefully and listening uh, very closely uh, to, um, to child care providers and also to families uh, as we move through the month of June uh, to get a sense of what the needs are uh, and what the barriers are to uh, bringing our child care uh, infrastructure back up to the level it was pre-closure. Okay, well, I think that, you know, there's two programs, two major programs in Chittenden County have, have already announced that they're closing. So it, it seems to me that there's already growing evidence that stabilization payments are necessary in order to make sure that our child care centers are able to survive this crisis. So it would be really helpful if your division could at least put together some kind of numbers about what you think it might take, um, because I think that that's the direction we're going to need to move into um, is ongoing stabilization payments if we want to see our child care system in the state of Vermont survive. And it would be great to have your support and your assistance in determining the level that is necessary. Uh, uh, yes, um, Senator Hardy, we're, we're happy to provide um, whatever information we have available uh, to the committee. Um, 
uh, how how would be the best way to do that? Uh, if, well, I guess I would defer to, <laughs> to my other committee mates. Well, I, I just want to second what uh, Senator Hardy said. I think that's the the thrust of our committee's uh, feeling is that ideally we would have stabilization payments continue up until the point where we raise uh, the amount that we're subsidizing the system generally so that, I, I, and we'll hear from Allie Richards in a second, but there's the sense overall pre-COVID that we underfund in a severe way our child care system. Now that we've learned that the hard way, uh, let's not make the same mistake twice. So um, if, if your office could provide an estimate the Senator Hardy suggested through the end of 2020, what would it cost to continue some form of stabilization? That would help us. Um, the other thing I just want to point out is Senator Ash makes a great point about the administration's uh, $400 million for economic re restart, um, which is a nice round number, a very impressive number the sort of number we don't normally throw around, but we have 1.2 plus billion to work with. So 400 million becomes a workable number. But if we were to, instead of 400 million, go with 390 million, that would still be a record-breaking historic amount of economic development funding, but you would have suddenly uh, 5 million or, or so to, put into something like this. So um, it would help to have estimates. It would help, again, to have the support of CDD for such a program. I understand that you know uh, the governor's recommend is what it is, and everyone serves at the pleasure of the governor. But I think on this one, we're all on the same page that we, we really need these centers. And that leads to my, my next question. Um, so first, thank you for um, what you did following your last visit to us. We talked about um, some confusion and guidance for programs. Some programs, at least one, was asking parents to pay 100% of tuition rather than 50%. You very quickly put out uh, clarified guidance. That program, uh, put that out to their parents and then promise to refund to parents or credit them with some of the money they had paid in inadvertently. And so that worked out very well. But I started thinking this morning about another scenario, which is parents at St. Mike's and UVM, I'm guessing, paid half tuition right up until the point where they learned that those programs were not gonna reopen. So if that's the case, you had people paying uh, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on the expectation that that would save the program that their child goes into and reserve their slot. Now it's as though they never paid that money because they have no program to go to. So my question is, in that case, does the program or the state or both owe those parents any of that money as a clawback? Because the agreement was that they would have reserved slots ready for them when the system reopened. Clearly the 60 families at UVM and the, the equivalent number at St. Mike's do not have that even though they paid that in good faith. So just I, that may be the first time that's been brought out or it may not, but what, what are your thoughts on that Deputy Commissioner? Thank you Senator Berth. Um, I, uh... Uh, frankly, I, I'm not familiar enough with uh, whether uh, UVM and St. Mike's uh, access the stabilization program to speak to uh, them in particular and the experience of those families. Um, I, I can say uh, that it's our understanding uh, that uh, UVM decided to uh, close their program uh, and that decision uh, dates back before, uh, or the reasons behind that decision date back uh, pre-closure. Um, and uh, I, I don't have further information about uh, St. Mike's decision, uh, but I can say that when a uh, program decides to close and, and makes that business decision, 
then uh, typically the community of uh, educators and uh, staff and of course families uh, come together to try to find a solution that meets everyone's needs. Uh, we saw this not that long ago uh, with the uh, um, series of or a collection of programs under the name of HeartWorks, uh, LoveWorks and STEAMWorks um, where uh, some of those uh, programs made the hard business decision uh, to close. Um, but uh, another provider uh, was able to come in and use uh, the space that would be vacated uh, and provide service to those families so that there was a minimal loss to uh, the number of childcare slots. Um, and in CDD, uh, we help with that process uh, as best we can. Uh, our role as um, within the regulated system is to uh, help providers uh, with variance requests so that um, when there's a change like that uh, with HeartWorks, LoveWorks, and SteamWorks, uh, and potentially uh, a similar change uh, that may or may not happen with St. Mike's, uh, that our, our licensing staff is there uh, to help with uh, any requests for variances and provide technical assistance uh, so that childcare providers uh, can access uh, facilities that are uh, safe and appropriate uh, and families can access childcare uh, that meets their needs. And from what I understand, the UVM Center is working in Williston to find space for their, for their families. But, and I guess it would be um, key to know whether St. Mike's or UVM accessed the stabilization program funds because uh, I, I think it's, it's easy to understand if, if they did, um, and these are not institutions that are going bankrupt. What they've decided to do is just close their, their childcare centers. Um, I think it's a different story if a childcare center took stabilization money and is bankrupt and they can't offer services and they don't have the money to pay it back. Um, but, if it were the case that UVM and or St. Mike's did access the stabilization money and then potentially also got payments from parents, we would need to know that, I would think, and redress that because it would be um, money for parents that uh, just went down the drain and these would be institutions that would be well off enough to reimburse if such were the case. So could I ask um, maybe at some point today or tomorrow, if you could just send me that information, whether those centers were involved in the program? I'd be happy to, yes sir. Great, other questions from the committee? Okay, let's go to Allie Rich, oh, I'm sorry, Ruth. That's okay, I, I just had a follow-up question for Melissa that came out of the last time um, we were together in this virtual space, um, which was a question about support for childcare programs that are looking for human resources support or guidance for particularly surrounding staff members who are not able to return to work because of health reasons or other reasons that make them unavailable. And I, I've heard from childcare centers that are just not sure what to do and they want to do the right thing, but they don't have the human resources expertise. You said you were going to look into that and I'm just wondering if you had any more information on that issue. Yeah, I did actually. Uh, I reached out to our partners at ACCD and the Department of Labor uh, to find out, you know, what uh, was the employment laws around all of that and we will include the responses to that in our next uh, FAQ. Um, but essentially, um, because Vermont's an at-will state, uh, the employer, and this applies not just to child care, it applies across the board. Um, uh, the employer and the employee relationship uh, is something that they work out together. Um, so we've got uh, a lot of details around that. Senator Hardy, you asked, um, I think, a couple of different layers of questions um, tied to that. So I'd be happy to um, send you what I learned from the Department of Labor. That would be great. Thank you. Senator Perchlick. That reminded me, I do have a question. One of the things I'm still hearing from providers is that problems that they had before COVID are just coming back and presenting themselves in starker light. And one of those is the licensure requirements. 
you know, and I hear anecdotally of a lot of centers closing before COVID because they just couldn't keep up with the, the licensing requirements and find the, the employees that had the right credentialing. And I wondered if the state administration, you know, has thought about waiving some of those requirements as we're losing more slots and so that we can keep those those slots open. Does that make sense, that question? Uh, who who would you like to pick that up, Andy? <laughs> well, I guess <laughs> anybody that, that feels qualified to answer. Uh, well, Senator, I, I can say that uh, we um, are very sensitive uh, to feedback like that. Uh, and uh, as part of our uh, rules promulgation process, uh, we have uh, a very um, strong commitment uh, to getting feedback uh, from uh, the field, from child care providers, uh, and also from families and uh, stakeholders and uh, the public uh, generally. And uh, as part of that process, uh, if there are rules uh, that the members of the public feel uh, lead to child care uh, provider closure, uh, then we, we certainly need to hear about that. Uh, and that would be very helpful for us. Um, Melissa, would you like to add some detail? Yeah, um, so actually, uh, currently uh, through the COVID response period as we were serving essential persons and then uh, as we're rolling into this transition, uh, our licensing rules actually have a variant request uh, a lever that can be pulled and uh, we are uh, processing and supporting uh, programs with a variety of variances, uh, one of which is tied to staff qualifications. Um, so uh, even without a rule change, uh, we are um, absolutely trying to be responsive to the context that we are in now um, and be able to uh, ensure that we've got the folks that we need um, on site to take care of kids. So those, those centers should be aware of how they apply for those variances? Yeah, we issued last week um, a frequently asked questions about uh, licensing uh, and a tip sheet about what to expect uh, when a licensor came on site uh, now that we are in this reopening phase. Um, and part of the frequently asked questions that we issued uh, did address um, that the variance option is available um, to them. Uh, again, not just for um, staff qualifications for a variety of uh, ways. Sometimes it's even serving children in different age groups. So we've got folks that maybe previously didn't serve school agers that are applying for variances so that they are able to serve um, school agers um, during this time. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Allie Richards. Uh, thanks for joining us, Allie. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, this is a conversation that's spun out in three or four different directions, but it's all the the same basic idea, which is how do we um, support going forward in the short term for the next six months, but also um, in the long term. Thoughts on, um, if I could ask you just to respond specifically to, to the structure that was laid out. In other words, the the closing of the two programs, the stabilization and incentive program, the current DCF restart stipend program. Um, what's your sense of those in terms of efficacy? Are they enough, et cetera? Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to share my perspective. And for the record, Allie Richards, CEO of Lesser Kids. And also, very quickly, I feel like within the context we're working in all of us right now, I just can't make any statement without saying that I personally and Lesser Kids as an organization stands with Black Americans and marginalized population to do whatever it takes to confront st structural racial inequity. And it is, we're becoming more and more attuned to the intersection of early childhood education issue and the incredible role that high quality childcare plays in moving us towards a more equitable and just future. So thank you for that. I just feel remiss to not say that in this context. Um, to your specific questions. Um, Thank you for allowing me on because you already alluded earlier that you knew what I was gonna say. Um, the stabilization grants played a crucial role in sustaining the majority of Vermont child care programs during this challenging time. We're luckier than most other states because of that. 
However, as you're seeing with these two closures, the Vermont child care system was substantially underfunded before the pandemic. So again, this is a hard message in this very difficult economic context to take in, but the child care system was in absolute survival mode in every single dimension before the pandemic, and this is really the straw that's breaking the camel's back. Um, the programs at UVM and St. Mike are unique in that they are tied into Vermont's underfunded, you know, higher ed challenges as well, but they are absolutely not unique in what they point to to all child care programs. They are absolutely the canary in the coal mine because they were implementing best practices. Okay, They were doing what we as a public have not funded and not valued. They were actually investing in very high quality programming, which included paying staff on par with public education benefits and public education colleagues. They had incredibly high quality because of that, they had incredibly high staff retention. They subsidized the cost of care for their families. As we know, CCFAP has not paid ever before COVID or now enough to actually reimburse the actual cost of care. Um, and so both of those higher ed institutions were losing substantial money on these programs because they were doing what we will not do yet <laughs> as a society. So the underlying issue here is the underfunding of child care. It's public dollars. Um, I mean, to Senator Perchlick's uh, question as well, Yes, logistically, there are variances. Of course, I'm really glad to hear CDD. You know, there is flexibility, there are variances, but moving back the bar on quality, you know, uh, is not really what we believe is, is uh, possible or necessary right now in this crucial moment. It's really um, flexibility and variances like that can help through this, pro this, this struggle, this moment we're in with a pandemic. But, <laughs> you know, it's the lack of money that's causing um, these closures and that is causing uh, programs to struggle and causing programs to not be able to find folks because they're paying poverty wages because there's no money in the system. So I just, you know, I have to make that point. It is a tough reality for us to face in a pandemic response, um, but it is what is causing these problems. And we can't just go, there's no magic bullet to go to these two programs to go to continuously do sub targeted subsidy and superhuman sort of uh, work to prop up these programs when really uh, it will continue to be a problem. We will lose more and more and more childcare over these months if we don't con if we don't commit to addressing this. So that to your specific question, Senator, um, the stabilization program incredible. Now the restart program, it, you know, the flexibility needed uh, is 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 already in the program. So that's very important because every single childcare program has a different situation. How many kids are coming back? You know, how many um, teachers can they retain with underlying health crises and age and other things? So uh, we just don't know yet how much money is gonna take, but we know 6 million will not be enough for all the reasons that you said. It's a good start, but it's certainly not enough, by the way, for summer camps and for childcare. And it's not enough for those who are seeing that half their families are not coming back so they can't make ends meet right now financially. So they may have to look at closure even though they didn't mm -hmm. think they had to. Um, and so we really have to look at increasing um, the, the dollars in the restart program as an absolute first step. So we have, uh, and I, I believe we actually submitted before my testimony to the committee uh, of building stronger documents. The beauty of these recommendations, Senator, is that they put us on a path with CARES Act dollars mm -hmm. to get us financially through this pandemic with child care for a lot of the issues that you've already pinpointed in the earlier conversation. And it sets a path to systemically starting to fund child care properly. Um, they're in the document I sent. I just quickly go over them as they intersect with, with your question. Uh, um, Allie, yeah. you sent that to us today? Yes, I believe my uh, colleague sent it to Jeannie. About an hour ago. Yes, it's posted on our website. Okay. Sorry, not very long ago. Um, okay. I can just very, in, in, in two minutes, Senator, I can just tell you what they are. I mean, yeah. basically, um, we've actually put, pushed this policy document out in the last couple of days and have over 750 signatures and dozens of businesses and counting um, signing on. And it's basically stating that we, you know, to support. Um, Children and families. All of these are absolutely appropriate with CARES Act dollars. Um, you really do need to increase CCFAP reimbursement rates. They were under before. Now it's more expensive and difficult to do this work. 
one lever uh, is absolutely increasing these rates and again sets us on a path into the future when we're able to dig deep and publicly finance more of this system. Our estimate is about seven, uh, four, excuse me, $450,000 per month. I'm sure CDD would have a much better estimate for you, but to adequately fund um, the subsidy rates. And then um, continuing CCFAP rates based on enrollment rather than attendance as a further financial stabilization into the field. U code is a great um, sort of piece of the puzzle for families, but we believe it's far cleaner and more stabilizing to just continue subsidies based on attendance, not enrollment. Um, excuse me, uh, enrollment, not attendance. And finally, expanding CCFAP's work um, search qualifications as we slowly restart our economy uh, beyond 12 weeks so folks can stay on the subsidy while they are looking for work if they have lost their jobs or had other impacts like that. The second piece, adequately funding childcare programs to actually adhere to these guidelines, the health and safety guidelines that are crucial right now. This is where the restart grants come in. Again, six million, huge start, not enough for childcare or for summer camps. Um, the amounts that Melissa said, as you end up stretching them over all these programs are not gonna backfill uh, the losses that these programs are seeing right now as they reopen. And, um, and then just continuing to understand uh, the fight to get PPE and source that material, mostly sourcing, frankly, even beyond the payment uh, is the real problem. Um, and then the last two categories are supporting early educators, all of the, reasons of these closures that you're seeing, what you have brought up in your questions. Uh, these poverty wages are not allowing folks to, to hire, replace staff that they're losing right now. Um, so we, um, again, have calculated um, it's about $14 million if you want to increase early educator wages now for sort of hazard pay in this environment, um, funding professional development and preparation to continue the pipeline, scholarships, loan forgiveness to get folks into this field, recruit and retain these early educators at this crucial time and then into the future. Um, and those are all appropriate expenditures under CARES Act. Um, and then the final thing is the infrastructure. Uh, you've heard it a couple times today, how our hands are tied in so many ways, big and small, because we do not have a modern IT system underlying this entire uh, child care industry. Um, and a one-time investment of $6.7 million gets us that we put it on a path last year with state appropriation uh, through many of your um, colleagues' committees. And uh, we haven't finished funding that and implementing that system. Um, so that's, you have that in writing. Um, those are our recommendations. Again, this is real money and this is a real structural systemic issue. I know it's hard uh, to face that with such a tough um, lagging state revenues and such a difficult pandemic response. But like you said, Senator Baruth, we all just got a front row seat to a broken system and the pain mm -hmm. is going to bring in all of us. And it was broken before and now we need it not just to open our economy to support these kids and families. It's one of the few things that's at an intersection of supporting vulnerable Vermonters and equity and revving the economy. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, thank you, Ali. I mentioned earlier the 400 million the administration has chunked out for economic development. This is, uh, you know, an overlap. If there's a Venn diagram of education and economic development, childcare centers, uh, whether they're home-based or not, are in that sweet spot. So if, if we're going to find money in the, in the COVID funding for anything, it, it should be this area because it's, it's two of our categories at once. Um, questions for Ali. Um, thank you for that, uh, that document and the write-up. I think that's very clear. Senator Hardy. Thanks, Ali. Um, I'm looking at your document and it says the overall need of approximately $33 million, but I don't see a breakdown of the things that you listed in this document. Do you, I've seen your previous breakdowns. I don't know if it's the same or if you've altered those breakdowns, but if you have just a little, I like tables, a little table, <laughs> that would be helpful just to see how you're breaking it out um, in the various categories you mentioned. We can follow up with that, Senator, thank you. And I think roughly I mentioned the sort of package of wage uh, supplements um, and professional development and loan forgiveness scholarships is um, about 14 million in our estimates. CCFAP is about $450,000 a month. The IT system is 6.7 million and there are other pieces, but those are the, the broad pieces, but yes, we can get that to you. Um, okay. While I'm unmuted, another point that I was gonna make earlier that Senator Purchley had, um, caught for me in his question is we actually have been hearing on a very logistical side that some um, variances and uh, on background checks and 
uh, deduping various needs uh, for multiple fingerprinting is something that could possibly be um, a way to streamline some, some staffing issues that we've continuously heard from the field. Okay, other questions for Allie Richards or for our other two witnesses? Okay, uh, thank you all so much. Um, obviously not the end of the discussion, but it's good to know what directions formally your, your department is headed in, in terms of funding. Um, if I look at what you've already got underway and what Ali's asking for, one, one possibility it seems to me is just taking the program, the startup program, and having another round later on in the fall um, that would allow you to use the exact same structure, the same calculus, you would just send out a second check. That wouldn't cover all that Ali's talking about, but it might be a, a simplified bureaucratic means of getting more out to providers. Um, so uh, thank you. And again, Senator Hardy had a request and I had a request for information. So when you can get us that, that would, that would be great. And uh, as always, feel free to stay around, but we will be doing very boring things in the next 45 minutes. So um, also feel free to drop off the call. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for your time on this. Yep. Thing. Thank you. Yep. So uh, committee, just a quick um, pick up on something else. Uh, Andy, I saw your email to uh, Senator Ash and Senator Kitchell. I'm glad you're um, moving forward on that. You remember Andy had said he would take a look into the HVAC system and see if there was a way to develop language to make sure that we have grants for districts in terms of their circulatory um, machinery. So um, Andy, just let me know when you've got something to show to us. I did send you an email after I sent that email to them. Oh, that was just to like hopefully get it on their radar so they don't go off spending all $1.2 billion. Well, there are, um, you know, as, as uh, you probably know from other contexts and committees, the Appropriations Committee is basically putting big um, fences around large amounts of money. So the idea is that when we've done the, the the BAA and the skinny budget or the three month budget, there will still be chunks on the order of hundreds of millions left to spend for the large budget, uh, which I think is wise on their part. And part of that is going into the administration's 600 million, uh, you know, 400 for economic development, 200 million for healthcare, and indicating that they're not just going to green light that massive amount, they're gonna probably shrink those down significantly, um, which will leave more for things like this, hopefully. Um, so let's, Corey, are you ready to take a vote? There's actually a new um, system. System that Jeannie will do it and I sign off on it, but okay. um, we're ready to go. Jeannie, you're ready? Jeannie, are you still with us? If not, I can take it. I have the sheet. Printed. No, I'm, I'm here. I was just okay. trying to post the document that Allie Richards uh, sent in response to Sen Senator Hardy's request. So that's why I, I was not available I immediately. I can't see you, Jeannie. Are you? Do uh, you want to see me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always prefer to see you. Oh, girl. All right, just a minute. I got to right. if, if you'd prefer not, that's another thing. <laughs> I just have to find the little screen here. Here we go. So this is uh, the extension on the All lead right. work. And uh, I, I, what was your rec recollection of what David Englander said they had spent on, on the lead program so far? Um, I, I clearly heard him wrong. And I checked with him and got another figure entirely. Anybody remember? No. I thought he said. Percentage wise or dollar wise? Dollar wise. 
not a lot. Barely anything. Hard, was, hardly any money. He thought that they shut off the faucets. Didn't he you know, say completely 30, instead of repair three thousand dollars? That yeah, sounds that, about right. It, it was really small. Right. It was and, penis. And, and so I, uh, I emailed him that night and I said, you know, yeah. I can't believe that that's all we've spent. And then he wrote back and said, no, no, we've spent seven hundred and sixty-seven thousand no, dollars. No, I know. Like, yeah, no, thirty thousand is what I wrote down. Yeah. Right. I did too. Yeah. Um, so I didn't go back and listen to the tape, but in any event, they've spent, you know, a little more than $750,000, which um, Ruth and Debbie will find that as amusing as I, I do. Because <laughs> we, we fought with the house for weeks where they, they kept criticizing our lack of testimony and talking about how accurate their numbers were. And it looks like we will come in way below what we put in our original bill, which was Imagine that. 2.5, I think. Okay, yeah, I, so I wrote down 133,000. 133. Yeah. So Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh. yeah, that's what that's what I wrote down, but who knows? I could have okay. misheard it, but well, yeah, it, certainly it, not 2.5 million. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Jimmy, would you take a, a roll call for us um, or do you uh, want Corey to do that? Uh, I think the clerk should take the roll call and I'll okay. record the vote and, and he'll verify it. All right. Do we have a motion? So this is uh, entertaining a motion to concur with the House on uh, the lead extension bill, which is mm -hmm. nine nine fifty seven. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, and I have a motion from Senator Perchlick. So second. Oh, and a second. Uh, discussion. Okay. Clerk will call the roll then. Senator Hardy. Aye. Senator Ingram. Yes. Senator McNeil. Yay. Senator Parent. Yes. Senator Perchluck. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. I was um, hoping we could find six different ways to say. <laughs> See. You, you could do the <laughs> What comes to mind is that auction show that was on. A and E like ten years ago, where the guy'd be like, "Yep." <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, you could go with Bangla. That's right. <laughs> what would it be? You know, well, they don't actually do that. They repeat. They don't really have a yes so much as they repeat whatever you were asked. Ah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, that won't require much explanation on the floor, but. It strikes me that neither Corey nor uh, Jim have reported anything at this point. So uh, would one of you like to, I mean, all you have to do is point to the findings, basically. Corey would love to, because I might not be present. Okay. Corey, <laughs> but Corey I do have a note on what I wrote down for remediation was $30,100. That's what yeah, I wrote. See, there we go. I wrote 33000 um, though we're all close. <laughs> we're but all like yeah. Whether you take Ruth's 133 or 33, or 30, it was 767. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think he went back and, and looked and refreshed his memory. Yeah. Okay, so um, Jeannie, does that, do you send that to Secretary Bloomer? No, I send it to S Senator Parent, who then verifies the accuracy of my, the votes as I recorded them. He sends me an email confirming the accuracy and then I send it to Peggy and she sends it on. <laughs> we could make it any more complicated, we would. Wow, we did not do that when we took a vote in ag this morning. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I, I don't know. That's the direct instructions I got, so. It's both I'm excited to start okay. as a different way. <laughs> Yeah, Bobby was the one that was so concerned about voting for us. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so everybody, if you could, let's, for our last order of business, just click on the, um, on the website we've got under Jim's name, the miscellaneous bill. And my, my thinking about this is that it's sitting in appropriations now 
and is liable um, never to make it out because of the $400,000 we put in for, it seems like a billion years ago, but proficiency-based learning, we put that in as a way of um, funding them to do more professional development, et cetera. So I started wondering, one possibility we, would be that we could tell um, Senator Kitchell that we want to just eliminate that appropriation and, uh, and then move whatever in the bill we are still behind and think is worthy of this moment, um, just ask them to move it out with an amendment that strips out the money and whatever sections we no longer want to move, um, assuming that we don't want to move them all. But um, as I look through it again, there, there are, it seems to me, a couple that maybe we might want to get rid of, but there are three or four that it seems to me would um, be worth, wor worthwhile to move. So if you look at the first section, the AVIC stuff, I mean, that couldn't be more apropos at the moment. Um, I'm thinking, you know, there was a part of me that thought, well, maybe we should, we should go at it again in light of where we are now financially. But I think it might be better just to send the House what we have. They will inevitably take a whole bunch of testimony and make changes to what we've done. So just getting it on their radar screen, giving them some language on higher ed, um, you know, the, the, the question and the danger of institutions going out of business and what would happen if so, just giving them something to chew on over there um, might be worthwhile in and of itself. Thoughts on that section? Yeah, I think it's very pertinent, as you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, so not, not hearing any objections. Let's think about leaving that in. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep in mind what Senator Ash said about at a certain point, he wanted to make sure that what we were working on uh, were things that would not seem out of place in what is still continuing to be an emergency. Um, obviously, we're, we're now moving things that are not COVID related, but you know, for instance, um, we'll get to it later, but um, the, the re or the language around gender equity on higher education boards, is that something we still want to do in light of what's going on at the board of trustees level? Does it, does it seem uh, out of scale with the challenges we, as we now understand them? with the Board of Trustees at VSC, for instance, and UVM. So let's hold that question. Um, I just use that as an example. We have the repeal of the oath um, on page five. And I don't see any reason why we couldn't leave that in. It's just striking a piece of old language. We have Bobby Starr's small school support language, which seems to me maybe more useful in light of what we want to do for supporting um, childcare and pre-K programs, because this would allow them to keep their small school grant and not worry about that if they want to have a pre-K program. Um, any objections on that? Okay, what about the wellness program? Well, you, you had asked me to, to bring that up to health and welfare. Yeah, how'd, how'd that go? Well, Senator Lyons has not allowed me to, to talk about it. <laughs> so I think tomorrow she has me on the, on the um, agenda. Agenda, yeah. So um, okay. I'll bring it well, up. All right. So if, if she likes it, a possibility is we could pop it out. Same with the, um, with, I think it's the next section. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's right. Five and six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, and then and the um, the uh, feminine hygiene uh, one. Two, yeah. Nine. Okay. 
So I thought that was, they followed each other, but theoretically those could be popped out and placed in health and welfare um, language. The elections language, section seven, um, I'm trying to remember, I think the house dropped this into a miscellaneous bill of their own. Um, but at this point, I, I can't see any problem with having it go twice because it may be that one or the other of our bills doesn't make it. Andy? I had a constituent that contacted me recently about this, pointing out some their, uh, um, the reason they didn't like it. I can't remember right now, but they seemed to, they had a good point. <laughs> I can't remember what it was right now, but uh, there, I had some problems with it. Yeah, well, it's, it's moving who appoints. Um, and it comes from Martha Heath in Essex Westford. And it's been an issue that she's been uh, very passionate about from last year to this year. Um, and she obviously a former rep and well thought of in the house. And so it, it takes on a certain um, importance but it's a good point. We shouldn't lose track of the fact that there are people who oppose it, no doubt. Right, and it's, it, just, it just like delays this to, to, to 2021. I think it's, it's people that got forced merged, so to speak, that, that when they have a board opening, they can't fill it. You know, it goes back to the merged board that appoints it and they- Yeah. But, but because of this notwithstanding to, 20, to the year 2021, those local boards can't send their own representative. The full board pick, picks the replacement. And so that just, some people don't like the fact that they're, the local town can't send their own representative if there's an opening in between elections. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's put an asterisk on that one. So far, that's the only thing that isn't a no brainer. Um, then this other language, I think, uh, do we have Jim on the line yet? No. Um, Jim had to step out for another call. I can't remember if both of these pieces speak to the same issue or not. Um, so let's, let's put those to one side. Um, and menstrual hygiene products, Debbie's going to, you'll talk about that along with the others tomorrow in Health and Welfare? Okay, then. Can I just clarify? Is that what the, yeah. the plan that would be added to the contraceptives? The free contraceptive bill, right? Okay. Theoretically, if if uh, Jenny is amenable. Mm -hmm. So the special education changes. I think we've already done. So that language would get pulled. Um. And then, let's see. And we pull the proficiency-based education. That's, yeah, we'll, we'll pull that. Appropriation, okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the gender balance UVM VSC language? I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how the events of the last three months have, you know, just wrought massive changes. Um, so I look at this completely differently now. I mean, it's still something that I think should go, but I, I, I foresee if we were to put it out alone right now, that people at VSC would think it incredibly tone deaf, that we would be talking about boards of trustees, but be exclusively concerned with gender balance, not with the survival of their system, loss of faith in their trustees, you know, resolutions from their faculty, uh, votes of no confidence in their trustees. Debbie? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's always the right time to do something that relates to the rights of um, people and, and adequate representation of the diversity of you know of, of people 
And actually, I think you can make an argument that if there were um, more diverse voices on these boards, that you would have better um, deliberative processes and, and you know, and, and a, a better mechanism of um, making sure that everything is taken is considered, in, you know, in deliberations. Mm -hmm. um, rather than less, and uh, that it might have actually helped to have had better balance before. And so yeah, fair, to it now. fair point. I'd say if we're going to put it out, maybe it would be good to somehow rewrite the language or put in a finding where we allude to something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, other thoughts, Andy? Well, I thought I kind of agree with Debbie. I think it's fine to keep doing it, but you could give them a little more time. Do we have a deadline here? I was trying to find. Uh, I think they just have to start reporting. Oh, okay. And then it's asking for. It's just a goal. Um, oh, by 2025. Yeah. Yeah, so it's aspirational, but, you know, there's been a lost year, let's face it. So we could change the date for the, um, you know, when, when we're expecting. Um, okay, other, other thoughts on that one, Ruth? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Debbie, of course, um, that I think always, it's always the right time for gender equity. Um, I, but I do understand your point, Phil. I think that, you know, there are some people who may uh, see it as irrelevant, but, you know, I think we can make the argument that they're wrong. Um, but I do want to point out, though, that the VSC board, I believe, is already gender equity, already has equal yeah. genders. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this, the UVM board that we were more concerned about because they were really radically off in their balance. And I think given the testimony we've heard about how UVM is going about things, one could make the argument that they would be more likely to um, uh, value equity in the budget decisions they're making and maybe wouldn't have made the decision to close their child care center and wouldn't have made the decision to um, uh, cut the salaries of part-time or you know low-paid faculty members, probably many of whom or most of whom are women if they had a board of trustees that was more gender balanced so that, you know, that the decisions they're making coming out of this crisis could be uh, more equitable if they had a more balanced board. So I think that's a fair argument still to make. Yep, agreed. Um, anybody feel differently? Okay, so let's, let's consider that we'll move forward with that. I think whoever reports that on the floor can indicate what Debbie and uh, Ruth just said, but also that this is not the be all and end all of what we're contemplating for the institutions. So among other things, we've talked about whether in the next budget bill, there should be some language around the money that goes um, to UVM and, and the VSC, uh, transparency of um, financials, among other things that we had promised we might look at language concerning. So that stays in. So when uh, Jim couldn't really be with us right now, but, um, and does everybody agree that we should get rid of the proficiency-based appropriation? Okay. Well, yeah, that's what's holding it up. The rest yeah, of the and, and yeah. you know, let's, let's face it, we, we threw that out there when there was a, a, a snowball's chance in hell we might get it. <laughs> not, now there's not. So, Andy, now the so. snowball has melted. <laughs> Is there any value in keeping all but the appropriations? Just like keeping the issue out there, even though AOE would just oppose having the language in there without the money? Or are you talking about getting rid of the whole section or to get rid of the money? Well, the whole section just is an appropriation. Right. So, um, you know, we, we took testimony on proficiency-based learning. It, it seemed uh, an issue worth addressing at the time. I think it still is, but the, the yeah. relative 
importance of it, given the other things we have on the radar screen now is just, um, so I, I don't think there would be any, any uh, crying anywhere if we were to get rid of the whole section. Okay. Um, okay, so what I will do then is I'll talk with um, Jim and ask him to, pre to prepare an amendment for us or for appropriations, whichever seems the easiest. And next time we meet on Thursday, we'll have him speak to those election pieces. And, um, and maybe we can, I'll talk to uh, Jane Kitchell and see if she's amenable to just voting out um, what they have if the appropriation is gone. There's not, nothing in there other than maybe the menstrual products, which do have a fiscal note attached. But if that isn't in this bill, then um, hopefully the rest should just sail out of appropriations. That would get everything that we have had prepared pre-COVID moved over to the other side. Um, any other business? Yeah, Debbie. Yeah, just um, so uh, while you're talking to Senator Kitchell, you're, uh, you you still intend to speak with her about the uh, UVM? Yes. Patient with the lectures. Yeah. Okay. Ab absolutely. Um, you know the the complaint that they had around not being able to get financial projections and data that that seems to me something that could be addressed in the language. Um, it's a it's a tougher question to think about because with both UVM and VSC, we're constantly asking for efficiencies and asking them to do more with less. So that's a, a very long-standing message out of appropriations. So basically the complaints amount to the fact that they are creating efficiencies at the bottom of the bureaucratic ladder rather than at the top. So, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to try to mesh what our committee might think about that and what the appropriations committee might think. Um, because if you spend time in appropriations, you know it tends to be a more, uh, I would say a somewhat more conservative, fiscally conservative committee than this one or other committees of jurisdiction, maybe by necessity. Um, so I will have that conversation. I'll update everybody once I do. Um, so we will meet on Thursday. We might have a short meeting on Thursday, um, but I will see all of you then. A Andy. Well, you can look at the email I sent you. I did send you kind of an outline of this program, this you know school ventilation okay. grant program, but let me know, you know, we can Perfect. talk Let's Thursday maybe or yeah, let's pick that up on Thursday. Okay. Okay. And Jeannie, if you want to stay on the line, we can do a little um, talk about Thursday. Okay. And just so you know, Jim has just entered the <laughs> meeting. <laughs> hey, Jim, we've just finished. But if you can join us Thursday, and if you can stay on the line now, I'll tell you what we sort of tentatively talked about. Can you, can you hang on for a few minutes, Jim? Oh, sorry. I, yeah, I couldn't. I, I I missed the beginning of your sentence, so I didn't know okay. he was being too. So yeah. Okay. So if Jeannie and Jim can hang out, I'll see everybody uh, tomorrow in the Senate call. All right. Yeah. Bye. See you soon. Okay. I'm ending live stream. Okay. Great. So Phil, sorry about that. I was on a call with Tim Ash talking about. Uh,